Okay, let's get started for the next part. Uh, let's see how fast we can go. I was hoping we would finish caches today since most of you know about caches, but and it's a fascinating topic, clearly, caches that has fascinated people for I don't know how long. The first cache paper that I know of is from 1962. That's the documented paper, but uh, I think people knew about caches even before that. Uh, and there's a lot of optimization that is done on caches, and it's still ongoing. We still don't have good enough caches, and there's a lot more to do, I'm sure. But this is a very traditional topic in the sense that you should know how caches work. You should know the fundamentals. And if you want to get performance, of course, optimizing caches is really, really important. And I'm going to give you the basics very quickly. We're, it's not clear how much time we will really spend, uh, because I want to also move on to some big topics uh, as well. I, not to mention that caches are not big. Actually, caches are so big that the major conference in computer architecture, ISCA, I-S-C-A, is called International Symposium on Cache Architecture. <laughs> because there were so many cache papers for a really long time in that conference. It's called International Symposium on Computer Architecture, of course. But people make, make jokes saying that, oh, this is cache architecture. Uh, so they're, they're clearly extremely important. Uh, and I think uh, you should really watch these lectures if I go uh, too fast here or stop me with some good question. Uh, and optional readings, I don't require these readings. It's an early cash paper by Morris Wilkes, which I'm going to cover briefly. I think this is also very important from 1965, but it's not the first cash paper, but it's a very nicely written, clear cash paper. And we already covered these in digital circuits, so we will go through uh, the cash concept quickly and try to get to advanced topics. But we'll start with memory first, because cash is really part of the memory system. It's really to accelerate uh, access to memory. Right? That's the key idea. That's what a cache is. But if you look at the programmer's view of memory, it looks like this. You have a chunk of memory, and you do stores and loads to it. That's it. Uh, and the abstraction is that programmer sees virtual memory today in most systems. You can, and as a result, they can assume the memory is infinite. Uh, the reality is that physical memory is finite. It's much smaller than what the programmer assumes. Uh, the system, the system software and the hardware, cooperatively maps virtual addresses to physical memory. And basically, if, it's, if, the, if, the, if an address that the program is trying to touch is not in physical memory, then there is infrastructure that moves that address into physical memory. Uh, and this is actually how things are designed today. So it's automatically management of, automatic management of physical memory transparently to the programmer. Why is this good? Now the programmer is free of managing memory. They don't need to do memory management, at least in the sense that they take the data from a backing store and put it into physical memory. And then after that, they can operate it. They can assume that everything is in physical memory because some, something magically ensures that whenever the program requests that thing, it gets into physical memory. Right? So that's the big advantage. Programmer doesn't need to know the physical size of memory nor manage it. A small physical memory can appear as a huge one to the programmer, and life is easier for the programmer. That's great. Now, this was not always the case. When Actually, there are some systems where this is not the case also. Uh, in, in some embedded systems, for example, you don't have virtual memory. You have to deal with physical addresses. So if you, actually, you have to make sure your program fits into physical memory. Or if it doesn't fit into physical memory, you write your program such that you move it from some disk to physical memory. And then only then you can access that data or instruction. Basically, you need to write your program in what is called overlays. It's called overlay programming. And you want to basically bring, uh, you essentially explicitly managing your program how to do this. There's no hardware or software support. Whereas virtual memory assumes software support and hardware support. But of course, the downside is the system software and the architecture cooperatively do this, and it's more complex now. The life, life is harder for somebody else. And this is a very classic example of the programmer and microarchitect trade-off. It's important to hit a balance in that trade-off. For example, uh, if you make the programmer manage everything, your system is not easily programmable now, so it may not be easily usable. Uh, if you make the microarchitect manage everything, then you have a complexity problem in the system. But the virtual memory is one of those cases that has worked out really well uh, by supporting a virtual memory in the hardware and the software together. Systems have become a lot easier to program because this is a really big nuisance. If, if, if you have to fit your program to some amount of memory size and, or your data to some amount of memory size, right? Okay, we cover virtual memory more in digital circuits. I'm not going to go into that in detail unless something happens later in the future. But this is also an important topic 
to, to know today. Because systems are, and also we think some, some of these things today. If we have, for example, a huge amount of memory, then how should we rethink about virtual memory? Uh, if we have like, uh, I don't know, uh, hundreds of terabytes of memory in a single node, uh, it's not gonna happen here soon, but it's already happening in servers, for example. If you do that, do you still need this sort of virtual memory management or should you go to a more efficient management? Rethinking some of these abstractions becomes interesting today, even, even, even something as, for something as fundamental as virtual memory. Okay, but we're going to focus let's, uh, for, uh, on the physical memory system a little bit. Basically, for physical memory, you need a larger level of storage to manage a small amount of physical memory automatically, and physical memory has a backing store, the disk, and we will start with that uh, physical memory system. We're not going to talk about the disk as much, but the memory uh, a lot to be. And for now, we will ignore the virtual to physical indirection, but you should always assume that that happens somehow. In existing systems, it always happens. There, you, you get a virtual address, and you need to translate it to physical address. And that consumes power and energy and other things also. And we may get back to it. This bill is not necessarily a must, but we may get back to it when the needs of virtual memory start complicating the design of physical memory later on. But let's talk about the memory system, physical memory system a little bit. Uh, ideally, we want everything, right, as you know. And when, when we think about a processor, it looks like this. This is a processor-centric view. We're going to look at the memory-centric view later on. You have this pipeline, it executes instructions, you need to supply instructions to it, and instructions need data, you need to supply data to it. Right? And ideally, this pipeline is perfect. It doesn't stall, it has perfect data flow, register memory dependencies, the data movement doesn't take time, zero cycles, enough functional units such that you can exploit the parallelism, and zero latency computation. That's the idealism over here. And we tried to get closer to that ideal in digital circuits when we cover different execution paradigms, for example. Instruction supply, we covered that also in digital circuits more. Uh, ideally, you want to get the data from the cache very quickly. We'll talk about the cache, but memory very quickly. You get infinite capacity, such that you don't run out of space for programs, zero cost, and perfect control flow. Whenever you get a branch, you know exactly what to fetch next immediately. But if you have a deep pipeline, you may not even have executed that branch at that point in time yet. So we, we talk about branch prediction, for example, and I think we may cover it in more detail. Uh, because it's such a fundamental concept. We'll talk about it in the context of GPUs a little bit. Data supply, on the other hand, uh, you want zero latency access, infinite capacity, infinite bandwidth, and zero cost. We're going to talk a lot more about the data supply, although data and instructions are really the same. They come from the same memory, except instructions have some other requirements because they really control the pipeline, like control flow is a requirement, whereas data flow, in the data supply you may have different requirements, like an access pattern. Uh, you get the access pattern with uh, very fast. Okay, so this, is, this brings us to the memory hierarchy because we want this idealism, but it's very hard to get that ideal uh, in all dimensions. As I, well, what I show you over here are different metrics, and we want to get the best of all metrics, but we cannot get the best of all metrics. As a result, we need a hierarchy. Okay, what does the hierarchy look like? This is an example picture that I showed you earlier. This is AMD Barcelona, uh, old, but it looks like a modern system today. Basically, you have a hierarchy, right? There are L1 caches over here, registers, L2 caches, uh, shared L3 caches, memory controllers, and uh, memory, physical memory, which is both a working space for programs as well as a cache for the disk. Right. So ideal memory, as I said, we want everything to be fast, uh, high capacity, zero cost, and infinite bandwidth. How do you get that? Good luck. <laughs> Basically, the problem is the, these requirements oppose each other. Uh, Bigger is slower, naturally. Faster is more expensive. And higher bandwidth is also more expensive. Uh, and lower latency is also even more expensive, actually, as we will see when we talk about the design. I don't have it here, but you should assume that. Uh, basically, bigger takes longer to determine the location. That's why it's fundamentally slower. Uh, bigger also may mean higher capacity. Uh, and it may be a fundamentally different technology to access. So as a result, it may be smaller for, for, uh, slower for that reason. Faster is more expensive. Uh, memory technology determines how fast you are, and uh, faster technologies are usually more expensive. SRAM is a lot more expensive than tape, for example, because you design the faster technology not for density, but speed. This is a classic trade-off between latency and capacity, actually. Uh, and as your capacity density is higher, your price is lower, you're less, less costly, because you're utilizing the same area uh, uh, for more bits, basically. Uh, okay, so SRAM is less dense, tape is much more dense. 
And today, tape is still important. It's a very important storage technology, uh, if, especially for cold storage, right? You have all this useless data in Facebook, for example. Where do you store them? Do you really want to store them in expensive uh, flash memory SSDs? I don't think so, right? I wouldn't store them there. You would put them in as cheap technology as tape, or even cheaper, if you can find it. And that's essentially what those folks are doing if they have these really cold data. Uh, whereas hot data, you want to store them at more expensive technology, perhaps. A higher bandwidth is more expensive because to get higher bandwidth, you need more banks, more ports, higher frequency, or faster technology, and they're all more expensive. And latency, actually lower latency, is more expensive because you need to even uh, design the system to be uh, in a different way. We'll talk about the latency capacity trade-off a lot when we talk about DRAM. Let's talk about memory technology. We've talked about DRAM earlier. But this is essentially dynamic random access memory. You have a capacitor. That's the access to a storage device, as I mentioned. Uh, I mean all this already. And you need to have an access device as well. In DRAM, it's the access transistor over here. Basically, you have one capacitor and one access transistor, and that's your DRAM cell. It's very compact. Uh, and we should look at the pictures of it later on. But uh, you, can, you can actually make it really dense today. And one problem, as you as we discussed, this capacitor leaks through the RC path over here. As a result, the EM cell loses charge over time. It needs to be refreshed. And this is your reading for your homework one, one of the readings for your homework one. So this is a fundamentally different technology than SRAM. SRAM has two cross-coupled inverters. We've seen this in digital circuits. You store a single bit. Basically, you capture a single bit, and it basically uh, is captured over here. This feedback path enables the stored value to, to store and to, to be kept in the cell. Persist, in this case, is not used as persistence uh, when power is lost, it's more persistence while the data is over there. Data doesn't escape if you're powered on. So you get four transistors for storage because each inverter is two transistors, as you know. Uh, and you need to have two transistors for access. And this is one of the most compact uh, SRAM cells. This is 60, uh, six transistor SRAM cell. So you can see that this is the access device. So the storage device is this, the access device is whatever is here. And then you basically uh, look at differential sensing of bit line and bit line bar to do the sensing uh, faster. OK, we're not going to go into the exact details of the microelectronics here. Otherwise, we will never finish talking about caches in this entire semester. Uh, but there's a lot of really interesting stuff that goes on clearly. This is another, uh, this is an aside, this is another technology which we're going to talk about. This is phase change uh, technology. This is basically, there's some sort of phase change material that can exist in two states. Chalcogenide glass is one example. One state, uh, it exists in amorphous. Basically, this state has low optical reflexivity and high electrical resistivity. Crystalline state is high optical reflexivity and low electrical resistivity. And you can have mechanisms through heating and cooling. You can change between these two states reliably. This is a fundamentally different technology, as you can see. right? It's actually resistive or optical, uh, depending on how you read it. Uh, and you change the states by heating and cooling. Uh, and you can encode high resistance state as, as zero and low resistance state as one. This is a relatively old technology. This is actually used in rewritable CDs. Rewritable CDs, you actually uh, take advantage of this low and high optical reflexivity to read a zero or one by shining light on the thing, but that's a very slow reading process. So it's actually recently there have been a lot of developments uh, that built access devices that can read the resistivity, uh, resistance of this in a reliable way in a fast way, very fast way, almost as fast as DRAM, not as fast, but almost as fast, maybe 4x, 10x, which is really close to DRAM, actually. If you think about SSDs, SSDs are on the order of two to three orders of magnitude slower compared to DRAM. Now we're within one order of magnitude of DRAM. So this has become really interesting because of that reason. Intel, uh, well, Intel doesn't admit this, but uh, the 3DX point is an example of a technology that may be phase change memory. I believe it is, uh, but we'll see. Uh, and uh, it's used for storage devices right now, and soon they may actually be releasing uh, memory devices as well. Uh, so you will have phase change memory devices that you could plug into your DRAM channels in the machine, hopefully. And this is the paper that we're going to talk about later on. Uh, so we did some of this research about 10 years ago, talking, uh, talking about replacing DRAM with phase change memory. So why is this an interesting technology? Because uh, now it, it can actually one of the advantages of this technology, which I didn't say over here, is it's non-volatile. Basically, now your main memory can be non-volatile. Whenever you plug it off, you don't, data doesn't get erased from it. Okay, how can you take advantage of it for a good reason? We're going to talk about this more, but I just wanted to motivate you. It's not just SRAM or DRAM, but this could be part of the memory hierarchy 
also. And it's already happening, I think, with the 3D exploit, the Optane SSD. And I think there, there will be more. But it has happened because of a lot of research, both at the device level, as well as architecture level, as well as system level going forward. But I think all levels are really important. OK, and this is the reading that you're going to have uh, later on. Just You can prefetch some of these readings if you're interested. OK, and that's another reading. That's a shorter reading. OK, so a fundamental concept in memory is banking. We discussed this in digital circuits a lot, actually. Uh, and the reason we discussed it was, uh, the, I first introduced it in digital circuits was, you want to be able to access uh, one word every cycle from memory. But if your memory takes 11 cycles, let's say, to access, just like it was in Cray 1, you cannot do that if you have a monolithic design for the entire memory. You have to chop it into pieces, banks, and each bank can start and access independently every cycle. And as a result, 11 cycles later, a bank gives you the value, the next bank gives you the next value in the next cycle, the next bank gives you the next value in the next cycle. As a result, if you have 11 banks, you can ensure that you're getting one word per cycle if your access latency to each bank is 11 cycles. That's the idea. Basically, a single monolithic memory access takes long to access. It's long first and doesn't enable multiple access in parallel. If you want to reduce the latency of the memory array access and enable multiple access in parallel, I was talking about the second one, uh, you can divide the array into multiple banks that can be accessed independently in the same cycle or in consecutive cycles. Now, each bank is smaller than the entire memory storage. Your latency reduces, and access to the different banks can be overlapped. So you can start one access in one bank in the first cycle, the next access in the next bank in the next cycle, the next access in the next bank in the next cycle. As a result, you get one word per cycle throughput, which is good. Of course, one issue is if you want to be able to do that nicely, as I described, you need to map your data to different banks. If your first access goes to the first bank and the next access goes to the first bank and the next access goes to the first bank, basically, if all of your access go to the, that single bank and they, you don't, they don't access the other banks, you have a problem. You're back to square one. Right? All of those accesses will be serialized. So you need to interleave the data across the banks in an intelligent way that matches your access pattern nicely. And we've talked about this and the importance of this when we talked about uh, SIMD processors, vector processors uh, in, uh, in digital circuits. But this is an issue actually in many processors. It's an issue in GPUs, for example, a critical issue actually, how you map your data because GPUs demand a lot of bandwidth because there's a lot of computational units. They're essentially vector processors as we discussed and you need to have a lot of banks. But this is very fundamental. So there, there's an application demand for it uh, for, for bandwidth reasons, but also there's a memory design demand for banks because you cannot design a huge monolithic array. You have to chop it up into some pieces so that you can actually reduce the latency. That's the first part of it. And this is what a bank looks like, basically. We've seen this actually earlier, but this is a maybe lower level example slightly. You have a 2D storage array, uh, two dimensional. Each, each uh, location over here is a cell. Uh, and basically you have a row decoder, it's rows by columns, uh, and you have a row decoder, you decode the row, you activate it, you bring the data, and then the least significant bits of the address decide which column you select, and you get the data out. And you don't have only this one, but you have another bank over here, another bank over here, another bank over here, and now you can overlap accesses to these 2D storage arrays. That's the idea. That's the beauty of it. And this is a bank in uh, SRAM. So the bank is very similar in SRAM and DRAM. Uh, this is uh, basically what's inside the cell is different, but the bank is very similar. I'm not going to go through the details of it because we've talked about it, but it's uh, kind of obvious over here. So basically, you need to access the bank. Uh, so let's go through the sequence because, uh, quickly. You need to decode the row and drive the word lines and selected bits drive the bit lines so you get the data over here. Entire row is read. You need to amplify it somehow or sense it. And then you need to decode the column. Uh, address and select the subset of the row that, uh, that is requested based on this address. And after that, to prepare the bank for the next access, you need to pre-charge the bit lines. Pre-charging the bit lines means uh, putting them back to a state where you can read them, read the next value again. We'll talk about that in DRAM in more detail later on. So uh, SRAM looks like this. Basically, you have an address that gets divided into row address and column address, and very similar. Uh, access sequence. Access latency is usually dominated by row selection and the bit line driving. Uh, and cycling time is dominated by 2, 3, 5. Two, cycling time means when you would start an access and then when, do you, when can you start the next access? That's called cycling time. In, in DRAM it's called row cycling time, TRC for example. Okay, 
So the, the, the slight difference in DRAM over here is, of course, there's refresh and there's uh, some, some difference in the sense amplifier design for SRAM and DRAM because these are different technologies to make it work. For example, in this case, in DRAM, the sense amplifier needs to amplify very small perturbation on the bit line, whereas in SRAM, you usually do a differential sensing. So those, are different, those require different sense amplifiers, basically. Uh, mm, but we're not going to go into that detail uh, in this course. And reads are destructive. You have charge loss over time, so that's the difference. But there's another difference pictorially over here that I put. As you can see, uh, here's, uh, now we've divided the address, not this way. So if you go back over here, we actually supply the whole address in a cycle, let's say, and then they get latched over here, which we didn't show. But you supply n plus m bits over here, whereas in DRAM, usually you supply the row address first, uh, and then activate the row, and then the column address next. And this is because, basically, DRAM is a separate chip. It has its own chip, and you want to, what do you want to do if you want to make the chip low cost? You want to minimize the number of pins that go into the chip, because those pins consume a lot of area, a lot of power, a lot of cost. So you want to reuse the address bits across rows and columns. Instead of supplying m plus m bits and having m plus m bits, uh, uh, m, m pins, you have maximum of n comma m uh, pins. Right. Assuming n and m are equal, then you don't have anything wasted. <laughs> so basically, you supply the row address first, and you supply the column address next in some other cycle. As a result, you minimize the number of pins that you need for address. And that's really important because it's a separate chip. Whereas SRAM, it's not a separate chip, at least in existing systems. Today, SRAM is very well integrated into the logic process. That's another difference between SRAM and DRAM. DRAM is not very well integrated into the logic process. It's really uh, designed for the capacitor. As a result, it's not on chip today, or DRAM doesn't have logic in it today. Whereas SRAM is completely different. It's very logic process friendly. Uh, and as a result, it's on the same chip. So wires on the same chip is not very costly. If you have, let's say, 28 as opposed to 14 to send the address, no problem. But if you have 28 pins as opposed to 14, that makes a huge difference. That affects the cost of the chip a lot. So, okay, summary, DRAM versus SRAM. DRAM is slower access, you have the capacitor, higher density, because the cell is smaller, lower cost as a result. It requires a refresh. It has destructive reads. Uh, basically, you destroy the row when you read it, so you need to replenish it. And manufacturing, is requiring, uh, manufacturing it requires putting the capacitor and the logic together, which is not uh, compatible with each other. Uh, SRAM, exactly opposite, basically. Faster, lower density, higher cost, no need for refresh, uh, and manufacturing is compatible with the logic process. There's no capacitor, basically. SRAM, in DRAM, a lot of things are dictated by how small you can make this capacitor. And it's becoming difficult, more and more difficult, to make that small. The capacitor looks like this right now, basically. They etch a huge thing inside the silicon, uh, and it's really, it becomes unreliable as we've discussed yesterday, as you make that uh, smaller and smaller. I'm going to show pictures later on. Hopefully. So the problem is bigger is slower, as we said, faster is more expensive. These numbers are out of date, and I'm not going to change them, uh, but if, if you're willing to update the slide, you can help me, no problem. Other technologies have their place as well, uh, but uh, it's so fundamental that these numbers, yes, they become lower over the years, but uh, the, uh, the difference between technologies still stay. Uh, and other technologies have their place as well. Flash, phase change memory, magnetic memory, RAM, resistive memory. There's also FRAM, for example, which is not very scalable. Uh, I think, I don't know what FRAM exec stands for, but TI uses it in their uh, chips. For, uh, it's non-volatile. Does anybody know what the FRAM stands for? Ferroelectric memory? I don't, I don't know what they call it exactly. Uh, but yeah, they, there are a lot of other technologies that exist that are used in specialized purposes. Okay, but we want a memory hierarchy because we want both fast and large, we're greedy. Uh, but we cannot achieve both with a single level of memory. So the idea is to have multiple levels of storage that get progressively slower as the levels become farther from the processor. And we want to ensure most of the data the processor needs is closer uh, to the processor, meaning at the faster levels. That's the idea. And that's what the memory hierarchy is, basically. You have a register file over here, which is part of the memory hierarchy, except it's compiler managed. You have the cache. Uh, it's managed by the hardware today. Uh, and as you go from left to right over here, you get higher latencies and higher capacities and lower bandwidth and lower cost. Uh, so why, why does this work? Because of the locality principle. If everything was random access, maybe this doesn't work very well, right? 
if you had zero locality. So what is locality? Basically, one's recent past is a very good predictor of his or her near future. For example, if you just did something, it's very likely that you will do the same thing again soon. That may be true. If you're listening to me, it's very likely that you're going to keep listening to me. If you're sleeping, it's very likely that you're going to keep sleeping. <laughs> yeah, that's temporal locality, I guess. Uh, but for example, since you're here today, there's a good chance you will be here again and again regularly. Spatial locality, if you did something, it's very likely that you will do something similar related in space. Again, every time I find you in this room, you're probably sitting close to the same people. And that actually works. <laughs> or you're probably sitting uh, in the same space also. So what, how does this translate to the programs? Basically, a typical program has a lot of locality uh, in memory references because it's composed of loops. Temporal locality means a program tends to reference the same memory location many times uh, and this all happens within a small window of time. That's the temporal aspect. Spatial aspect is a program tends to reference a cluster of memory locations at a time, consecutive, around each other. That's the spatial. Notable example, instruction memory reference. Because of the sequential paradigm, you go from this instruction, the next instruction, the next instruction, the next instruction. You increment the program counter, right? And you get very good spatial locality if you keep incrementing the program counter. Array or data structures references, usually they're laid out sequentially in memory. And if you're, for example, traversing an array with a regular index, you keep incrementing the index, that's very spatial, right? That's true for, that could be true for linked list and other stuff. But, but this is very fundamental, basically. So caches exploit these locality. Basically, uh, in a cache, you store recently accessed data in automatically managed fast memory. This is called cache. And this exploits temporal locality. The anticipation is that the data will be accessed again soon. You bring the data from main memory, and you store it in this small cache, small fast memory, uh, that keeps it for a while. The anticipation is that because you brought it from main memory, you're going to touch it again soon. Right. Uh, recently accessed data will be accessed again in the near future. And this is what Morris Wilkes had in mind when he wrote this paper. Uh, he was thinking, oh, programs exploit temporal locality. That's why we should have automatically managed memory that automatically accumulates itself words I think that's what he used over here. Uh, yeah, they use this cost of a fast core memory of, say, 32,000 words as a slave to a slower core memory of, say, 1 million words in such a way that in practical cases, the effective access time is nearer that of the fast memory than that of the slow memory. I think it's beautifully written. That's a very nice sentence, actually. I wish I, I saw more of these sentences in the papers that I reviewed these days. <laughs> I think people are less careful in writing, maybe. Uh, OK, this is very nice. Uh, basically, that's what exactly he had in mind. But there's also another principle that caches today exploit, which is spatial locality. Uh, basically, you can store addresses adjacent to the recently access accessed one in automatically managed fast memory. So if you're accessing address A from memory, you, okay, you bring access a, uh, address A and store it in the cache, but also you bring address A plus 1, A plus 2, A plus 3, A plus 4, the block that this particular address belongs to. So that, the idea is to logically divide the memory into equal size blocks and fetch to the cache the access block in its entirety. Even if you're accessing part of the block, don't just bring that one, but bring the stuff that's around that one that's part of the block. And the anticipation is that nearby data will be accessed again soon, and it turns out that it's true because of as what we discussed, right? Programs exhibit these patterns, sequential accesses, array traversals, or just data structures that are laid out uh, sequentially and you access parts of them but those parts happen to be close to each other in space. Uh, and this is what IBM 360 85 implemented. This was one of the uh, major processors with a cache. Uh, uh, Maurice Wilkes didn't discuss these blocks, but IBM 360 85 actually had a 16, 16 kilobyte cache with 64 byte blocks. And you can, this is a beautiful paper that discussed it in 1968. And today is nine, 2018, right, 50 years. And we still have 64 byte blocks in a lot of the <laughs> existing processors. So we're going to question that mentality later. <laughs> but for now, I assume that this thing is there because it works actually in many programs. But it's not clear if this is the best way of designing systems uh, today. Oh, so block size is, of course, important. I'm not going to go over the trade-offs a lot uh, since we're at slide 28, and I want to be at slide 122. <laughs> that gives you an idea of what we, we intend to cover. But uh, that's a joke, of course. We don't have to cover all of that. Uh, but 64-byte blocks has actually been the general purpose block size in many systems. Uh, some systems, some IBM systems actually increase that because they, they saw good sequential access in their programs. Some of the IBM systems has 256-byte blocks. But I think a lot of the general purpose processors today uh, had, have 64-byte blocks. Interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, 
just a note on manual versus automatic management. Manual means program manages data movement across these memory hierarchy levels. This is usually too painful for at least normal programmers uh, on substantial programs. Especially if program complexity grows, this becomes very difficult. Actually, you could say compiler could do it, and locality has been very difficult for compilers also in general. People develop techniques, but it's not as easy. Uh, so completely manual management of a cache is not actually easy, it turns out. And, but, but these exist actually, embedded processors still do it. There's on-chip scratch pad, GPUs, which you could consider was an embedded uh, specialized accelerator for a long time, it's still that way. It has a scratch pad memory, they call it the shared memory on chip. Uh, you can address it directly and you have to manage it directly. They also have caches that are automatic. So they have all kinds of memory actually. So there's a manual manage, uh, uh, manual manage and automatic manage. But in GPUs, for example, it's really important to manage it really well so that you get very high bandwidth so that you can improve the performance of your program. Uh, automatic management, of course, this is the classic microarchitecture programmer trade-off again. The hardware manages the data movement across the levels transparently to the programmer such that the programmer doesn't need to do anything. Right? Clearly, the programmer's life is easier and usually simple heuristics work, but people find out very quickly that they don't work very well. For example, keeping the most recently used items in the cache is called LRU, least recently used policy, is a very commonly used policy. It's good, but not good enough. There are many workloads that don't follow that pattern, for example. Uh, the average programmer doesn't need to know about this. Uh, you don't need to know how big the cache is and how it works to write a correct program. That's great, but what if you want a fast program? Then you need to know all of that again. <laughs> you should know what your cache size is such that you can partition your program such that your working set fits in the cache. And you can also actually prefetch the data into the cache manually. So if you really want to get the highest performance out of your system, you're back to manual management. In fact, your life is even more complicated perhaps because hardware is also doing management underneath and you may not know what it's exactly doing. So now there's a disconnect, right? You want to get the highest performance. You know some things about the hardware. You know a lot about your program. You can match the program to whatever you know in the hardware, but the hardware is also doing that management and you cannot turn it off. So this may not be a good system design overall, right? If you, especially if you want. So maybe, maybe there needs to be another interface over here, uh, optionally manual or something like that, or you can carve out some space in your uh, cache where you manage that and hardware manages some other part. And it may be very good at managing that other part, right? So there's still, this is still evolving as you can see, right? Even though there's been more than 50 years of research in this area, we're still not at the best point. Okay, so automatic management was actually what, uh, what uh, Morris Wilkes uh, had in mind, uh, basically when he wrote this paper. And basically by slave memory, I mean one which automatically accumulates to itself words that come from a slower main memory and keeps them available for subsequent use without it being necessary for the penalty of main memory access to be incurred again. Again, this is a beautiful sentence. Uh, it's very clear, hopefully. Uh, so there's a historical aside. There are actually other cache papers. This is in the more system space, managing the disk. And this is more at the uh, hardware space. This is from the National Cache Register, NCR uh, company. And they actually, uh, in, I believe this is the first original source that I could find uh, with the help of my students uh, that introduced the cache. Uh, at, at least the hardware cache as we know it. And you, you can see over here, uh, they called it the Luca site. Uh, and you can see that there's associative address storage. This is the tag store, and this is the data store, and this is the analog usage indicators, whether you, you actually use that thing uh, over there. So that's a reference bit, basically. It's very, it's very much like a cache today. There's a control logic, clearly, and that's the, uh, yeah, that's, the, that's the real main store over there, which is main memory. Okay, so a modern memory hierarchy looks like this. As I said, the register file is part of it, but it's manually managed, compiler managed. There's an L1 cache, uh, L2 cache, L3 cache, main memory, and you could keep adding, of course, right? And this all automatically managed. And there's also uh, a management, uh, the, the demand paging, the virtual memory management that kicks in over here. And this is the memory abstraction, right? Registers are really not part of the memory abstraction because we have a separate namespace for them, right? The general purpose register space. Uh, if you actually have a scratch pad, you have another namespace that's a separate memory uh, with separate addressability. Uh, but all of this is part of the same namespace, which is uh, the, uh, the virtual memory address space, which gets translated into a physical memory address over here. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. And this may be growing. And there are many design choices that clearly go into it. We're not going to cover all of the design choices, unfortunately, we don't have time. Some of them we actually cover in digital circuits, some of them 
uh, we will cover here. I'm not going to go over this, but I think I'd recommend that you can take a look at it. This is very obvious. Uh, basically, it's a hierarchical latency analysis. What is the latency that you see at each level? Clearly, you have a hit rate at each level and a miss rate at each level, and the sum of that should be equal to 1. There's a probability that you, uh, the axis hits, and there's a probability the access, that the axis mi misses. And if you want to calculate the access, the latency, perceived access time, that you see uh, at a level, what you get is a hierarchical equation, basically. And uh, what this says is you, uh, you have the hit rate, you multiply it by the hit time, and you have a miss rate, you multiply it by uh, the miss time, uh, or the access time, plus the, access, uh, the time that it takes for you to bring the data from the ultra levels of the memory hierarchy. And you don't know that, that's a hierarchical equation, that's Ti plus one, which is the access latency that you see at the ultra levels. Now at the ultra levels you have another thing, which is the hit rate of that level, time to access of that level, miss rate of that level, times time to access of that level, plus time to access the other level, right? So it's, a, it's an onion-like equation, right? <laughs> And, that's, uh, and this is very simple, so you can actually do this calculation yourself. So you get a recursive latency equation that looks like this. And the goal is to achieve the desired low la latency within a log cost. Ideally, you want the latency to be the same as the latency. Uh, uh, basically, ideally, you want everything to hit in the cache, right? <laughs> let, me, let me put it exactly that way. Ideally, you want everything to hit in the cache. Clearly, that's not going to happen. Uh, as a result, you want to maximize the hit rate as much as possible. Uh, but uh, to be able to do that, you want to keep the miss rate low. Uh, you can increase the capacity that lowers the miss rate, but that increases the access latency probably, depending on how you increase the capacity. Well, if you increase the capacity, you're going to increase the access latency. That's very fundamental. Right? Or you can lower the miss rate by smarter management. You can do intelligent replacement. You can anticipate what you don't need, kick it out. Uh, you can do prefetching into the cache. So those intelligent management techniques uh, lower your miss rate clearly without affecting your access latency. Potentially. That's the idea. So it's, a, it's really a trade-off between access latency and miss rate. Uh, and you also want to access, uh, keep the ultra levels access latency low. Uh, to be able to do that, you may actually need to have uh, lower, uh, more, uh, faster lower hierarchies, ultra hierarchies, but that increases the cost. You may introduce more layers. And this is exactly the reason why more layers of cache has happened, because you wanted to, okay, you miss in this level, you want the next level access to be fast, but if the next level directly goes to memory, it's not fast, so you introduce another level of caching. And then you have some probability of hitting over there. So basically it's a compromise. This memory hierarchy is a huge compromise, and you can see that that's a complex part of the design. We're gonna talk about how to think about it differently. If we were not moving data as much, maybe we would not have this complexity in the system as much. Okay, so actually if you do this hierarchical latency equation, uh, you can do this with, by plugging the, in these values with a Pentium 4 example, which is an old processor by today's standards. Uh, you can actually see some fun. For example, the, if your miss rate is not, uh, if your miss rate is 10% in the first level, L1, if your miss rate is 10% in the second level, the access latency for a load you get is about 7.6 uh, cycles. But your inherent access latency of the first level is four cycles. That's designed to uh, provide four cycles uh, for each integer. If you reduce your miss rates such that they're 1% as opposed to 10%, you get very close to the access la inherent access latency of the L1 cache, 4.2, as you can see, com compared to 4. Uh, but now you can actually have different trade-offs. Your miss rate at the first level, it's 5%. Miss rate of the second level, 1%. You get exactly five cycles of access latency. But you can also get five cycles of access latency by making different choices, by making your L1 cache much much uh, more intelligent, 1% miss rate, but making your L2 cache less intelligent, maybe 50% miss rate. Right. So you can actually get the same latency in different ways. Once you have different hierarchy levels, you have different, different uh, degrees of freedom uh, in terms of optimizing for your performance. That's, that's the point of the slide, basically. You can get close to five in different ways. And the implications are different, of course, in that case. Of course, I didn't tell you how you get those. This is just uh, example numbers that I plugged into the equation. Okay, let's talk about cache basics uh, again very quickly. Mm, okay, we have 30 minutes and 90 slides. Do you think we're going to do that? <laughs> but there are no questions so far. So I assume these are all good with everyone? Okay, it's all basics. Is it boring? Who says it's boring? Don't, don't be shy. Okay, there's one. That's good. Who says it's not boring? 
Okay, who's ambivalent? Okay, <laughs> some people don't care. Okay, so I'm going to go faster because <laughs> uh, there's one person who finds it boring. Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not boring, but just, uh, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, uh, that's so exciting. Uh, exactly. It's not as exciting as processing in memory, probably. Uh, I agree. <laughs> but I think this is also important to know. But yeah, let's, uh, let's go through this. Basically, I, you know what a cache is. I'm not going to go through this. But this is a very general structure. You could have a web cache. You have a long latency access to a server. You don't want to access the server again, so you have a cache in your browser uh, to keep the pages, right? And it happens a lot. Uh, we use it most commonly in the on-die context, at least uh, in the hardware cache. It's an automatically managed memory hierarchy based on SRAM, right? Uh, but that does, that's not necessarily true. Uh, we have DRAM caches today also, and we, we may talk about them uh, when we talk about especially non-volatile memory. So basically, we want to memorize in SRAM the most frequently accessed DRAM memory locations to avoid repeatedly paying for the DRAM access latency. So there's some basics. I'm going to rush through them very quickly. So I assume you know what a block is. That's the unit of storage in the cache. And as I said, memory is logically divided into cache blocks that map to locations in the cache. On a reference, you may get a hit or miss. Hit means uh, your, uh, the data that you're accessing is in the cache, and you don't access memory. Miss means it's not in the cache. You bring the block into the cache. You may have to kick something else out to do it. There are many important design decisions and caches, and people have really looked at a lot of these things, like placement, where and how to find and place a block in the cache, replacement, what data to remove, what block to remove to make room in the cache, granularity of management, do you have large blocks, small blocks, do you have sub blocks, we'll talk about that briefly, but we covered that in digital design, write policy, how do you handle the writes, stores, instructions versus data, do we treat them separately, there are many, many others. And this is how it looks basically in hardware uh, and blocks uh, over here. This is the abstraction. You supply the cache an address. Tag store says, is this address in the cache? And it has some bookkeeping information. Data store gives the block if the address is in the cache. Uh, and you can calculate the cache hit rate this way basically. And you can calculate an average memory access time, uh, which is the hit rate times hit latency plus miss rate times miss latency. And one question is we're going to talk about later on, can you reducing uh, average memory access time, reduced performance. Anybody has a guess over here? Ideally, you want to minimize the access time, right? However you do it, doesn't matter. But can you uh, actually reduce performance if you reduce the average memory access time? Or can it happen somehow? Your intention is, of course, not to reduce performance, probably, when you're trying to reduce the average memory access time. Yes? Well, if you make the cache too small, mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah. Then you have more misses, I guess. That's true, but why would that reduce reduce performance? Uh, reduce performance, yes. Uh, or if we increase the hit rate by making the cache bigger, the <laughs> GPU could get smaller. Uh -huh. I see. So you're thinking about the other stuff <laughs> in the system. Because there are space constraints usually. I see. Basically, you may take out something else from the chip. Yeah, that's true. I wasn't considering that actually. I was considering all else being equal. So I think what you said actually gets to what I'm going to discuss. But basically, you may actually increase the misses too much, and you may actually change the nature of the misses. So your misses may actually uh, not be serviced in parallel. They may be serviced serially. As a result, uh, you may actually reduce the latency that, that, uh, that on average you see, but each miss is more costly now for you. We're going to talk about that. So th this something, this, Basically, this metric doesn't really consider how long you stole the processor. This metric basically is a metric that looks at just the cache, how long on average each access takes. But uh, how long you stole the processor is related to that, but it's not only related to that. It's also related to how each miss actually affects how long you stole the processor. So we'll take a look at that. Actually, that's one of the readings. So let's go through this basic hardware cache design. Uh, we'll start with that, and we'll examine a multitude of ideas to make it better. As I said, memory is logically divided into fixed size blocks. Each block maps to a location in the cache, and this is determined by the index bits in the address. So you take an address, let's say an 8-bit address or toy address, you chop it into pieces. You basically, let's assume that you have uh, three bits for byte and block, which means that uh, you have eight byte blocks in this case, assuming this is byte addressable, right? And index bits. Uh, tell you uh, how to index the tag and data stores. Basically, 
if you look at this address, and if somebody gives you this address, you can immediately understand the structure of the cache, right? Basically, first of all, I have three bits to identify byte and block, which means that I have eight byte blocks. Uh, I have uh, three bits for the index, which means that I have eight locations, right, in the cache. And tag bits are two bits. Now, uh, that's, uh, that's, that tells me the tag store size, at least partially. So cache access, you index into the tag and data stores with index bits. I'm going to show you an example. You check the valid bit in the tag store. You compare the tag bits in the address with the store tag in the store. And if a block is in the cache, the store tag and the valid bit, uh, the store tag is valid and the, uh, and the tag matches with the tag of the block. Let's take a look at uh, an example of this. So this is our main memory. We're going to assume byte addressable memory. You have 256 bytes, just like in the previous address. You have eight byte blocks. So as a result, your entire memory contains 32 blocks. And these are the block numbers. So assume you have a cache 64, that has 64 bytes and eight blocks. Direct map means a block can go only to one location. So direct map looks like this, basically. You have a tag store, valid bit, tag, and the data store. Yes. And this is your address. This is what your address looks like, just like what I showed you earlier. Basically, whenever you get an address, you take the index bits. In this case, basically, this is, this is also called the block address. You chop off the byte and block. You get the block address. And the bottom three bits of that block address is your index. So you index with the three bits. If the three bits are all 0, 0, 0, you go to the tag store over here. And then you have a valid bit and a tag. If valid bit is valid and tag matches, the tag that's stored here matches this tag, you get a hit, and you can trust the value that you've stored in the data store. Hopefully, this is obvious for people who've studied caches. And if you haven't, please do study. Uh, but it's a very simple concept, basically. Uh, and this is the logic. This is the hit logic. And basically, if you want the exact byte in the block and not just the entire block, then you need to use that byte in the block to mux out, to select uh, the appropriate byte. And that's part of the address, as you can see. So it's very simple. Uh, so if you access block zero for the first time, what happens is you bring it into this location. You set the valid bit, set the tag to zero, zero, uh, and index is clearly all zeros because it's block zero. And you set the, pl place the block over here. In the next access, you use the same index. You go to this place. You get a valid bit, and the tag matches. Zero, zero you stored here, and zero, zero you have here. As a result, you get the data for potentially a different Python block. right? Now, one problem with direct map caches is addresses with the same index content for the same location. So I mark these as with green over here. These are the blocks in memory that map to the same location because they happen to have the same index, index bits, the, the yellow ones over here. So if you're, for example, accessing block 0 and block 8, 1, 2, 4, 8, yes. And if you keep doing block 0, block 8, block 0, block 8, block 0, block 8, you have a problem. Basically, you have conflict misses. You can only store block 0 or block 8, but not both at the same time because they have the same index bits and they map to the same location in the tag store and the data store. And you, don't, you just don't have the flexibility to store them both. As a result, your cache hit rate becomes 0%, right? If you're doing 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8. And you, if you're not intelligent uh, to realize that. Because if you realize that, you may do something else. If you keep doing 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8, uh, whenever you access 8, you don't kick out 0. You just keep 8. Or you, you just keep 0, one of them. And then you get 50% hit rate. Right? That's, an, that's a slightly intelligent management policy. You don't get 100%, you get 50%, but you're still direct mapped like this, which is nice. OK, so direct map cache, as I said, one index belongs to one entry. So two blocks in memory that map to the same index in the cache cannot be present in this cache at the same time. And can lead to a 0% hit rate if more than one block ac uh, is accessed in an uh, in interleaved manner mapped to the same index. So I showed you block 0, block 8. You can assume A and B. And these are called conflict misses. They conflict in the same location in the cache. I already said this, I think. So basically, how do we eliminate this? Well, one way of reducing this uh, problem is adding set associativity. Meaning, at an index, you don't store only one block, but give the capability of storing multiple blocks. That's the idea. So if two blocks have the same index bits, they can be stored because there are multiple locations for that same index value. You can think of this geometrically also. Instead of having one column of eight, in this case, we had one column of eight, and we could store only one thing in each row, have two columns of four. Basically, now your tag store looks like this. 
It's called a set. Data store looks like this. You can store one block here and another block here. They map to the same index. Right. So now your index bit has reduced. Byteam block stays the same because we didn't change the block side, but you have more tag bits. That's the idea. Now you can store 0 over here and 8 over here. And if your pattern is 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8, you get 100% hit rate, in the steady state at least. But now your logic is a little bit more complicated because you, know, it's, you need to match this uh, tree, right? And also, this logic is a little bit more complicated. You add another mux to the data stores, right? So this is the key idea. The idea is basically you have associative memory within a set. Why is it associative memory? Because you do the tag comparisons for both of them. You really, your part of your address determines what data uh, is there. So you really associate uh, over here. So the, uh, uh, the upside is this accommodates conflicts better. It's obvious, hopefully. You can store two things as opposed to one in the same set index values. These both map to 0, 0. But now it's more complex, slower access, and larger tag store. Larger tag store because this grew, right? You reduce the index bits, but you increase the tag uh, size. OK, so hopefully that's clear. But of course, there's always a problem. What if you do ABC, 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 right? Now you have <laughs> the same problem. You get lower hit rate. Uh, as a result, you can have four-way associativity. Now instead of having uh, two, uh, two columns of four, you have four columns of two. But now things become more complicated. Your muxes become wider. This logic becomes more complex. But the likelihood of conflict misses become even lower. And your complexity increases clearly. But you get lower miss rate. But as a result of these more complexity, your latency also increases. Because now your critical path is how fast you can get this data out. right? But that data out comes after this logic over here. right? Your critical path is increasing because now you need to get the result of all of these comparators and this mux to get the data out, and your hit signal as well. Modern caches are designed to mi uh, minimize the uh, latency of the hit signal, uh, but associativity doesn't help, of course, right, if you increase. So fully associative means that uh, essentially you don't have any index bits. A block can be placed in any cache location. It's fully associative. You basically compare the entire tag. The entire tag uh, is your uh, 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 yeah, basically what happens is I don't have the address over here. But in this case, you have five bits of tag. Entire cache block address is your tag, basically. OK, and it looks like this, basically. So it's very flexible placement. You can place any uh, location in any cache location, any block in any cache location. But also now our replacement policy may become more complex, depending on what you would like to do. Right. OK, uh, I think this is blinking over here, so you may want to do something about it. <laughs> OK, so hopefully this is clear. So clearly, this, there are trade-offs here. Degree of associativity uh, determines how many blocks can map to the same index. Higher associativity gives you higher cache hit rate, slower access time, more expensive hardware. Dimin and you get diminishing returns from higher associativity. And the curve usually looks like this on average. But of course, there may be jumps in different workloads. But it's usually diminishing returns. There are a bunch of issues in set associative caches, actually. You can think of each block as, uh, in a set, having a priority. This indicates how important it is to keep the block in the cache. One key, one key issue is how do you determine and adjust these block priorities? And there are three key decisions you make, actually, whenever you bring something into a cache. You need to insert it somewhere in the set. You need to promote it or evict it. Insertion means what happens to priorities when you bring the block into the cache. Where do you insert the incoming block? Whether or not to insert the incoming block into the cache, and people have developed many mechanisms for bypassing, for example, not inserting into this level, inserting into some other level, or not even inserting into the cache at all. You've got to be very careful with those decisions, of course. Promotion is what happens to priorities on a cache hit. Basically, whether you change the block priority, how do you change the block priority? Eviction and replacement means what happens to priorities on a cache miss, which block to evict, and how do you adjust the priorities? Because it's really about the priorities of all of the blocks that you have. And you have more information in all of these cases. Whenever you're inserting something, whenever you're promoting something, whenever you hit in the cache, or if you're promoting something, whenever you're hitting in the cache, you have more information. And where you need to evict something or replace something, you have more information. So it's good to reassess the priorities of the different blocks in the cache. Uh, so eviction and replacement policy dictates which block in the set to replace on a cache miss. Any invalid block first is a good idea, usually. If you have an invalid block, uh, put something there. If all are valid, then you need to consult the replacement policy. And there are many replacement policies which we're not going to go through. Random is one, which may be very effective, actually, if your access is uh, 
uh, are thrashing the cash. FIFO, first in, first out, least recently used, most re not most recently used, least frequently used, least costly to refetch. You can imagine many of these, right? Because memory access have different costs. So for example, one may be a robot for hit, might be a robot for miss. One may be satisfied from the next level of the cache, one may be satisfied from all the way from memory. So these are different costs. How do you take that into account? Most existing policies don't take that into account, but we may talk about that. Hybrid replacement policies are also important. Uh, is there an optimal replacement policy? Depends on what, how you define optimal also, right? Are you max, what are you maximizing? Are you maximizing hit rate? Is that the best thing to do? Are you maximizing system performance? Then how do you define optimal? That becomes much more tricky to come up with an optimal definition in that case, or how do you, how do you achieve that optimal at least? Uh, so okay, let's talk about LRU. LRU has been the most commonly used and many variants of LRU has been used. This is evicting the least recently accessed block, least recently used. The problem here is you need to keep track of access ordering of blocks. It's really an ordering. Uh, for example, in a two-way associative cache, what do you need to implement LRU perfectly? What is the minimum hardware cost if it's two-way associative? Basically, you want to keep track of which one is the least recently used, which means that you just need one bit, right? Either, either, either way zero or way one. One bit per tag store. Uh, well, one bit per set, actually. Not one bit per tag store entry, one bit per set. That's very simple, clearly. Now, okay, let me ask you this question. What about four-way associative cache? What do you need to implement LRU perfectly? Okay, you, you, I think you raise your hand first. Let's see. Three bits? Three bits? to know which one is 0, 1, 2, and 3. So you need all, like, okay. OK. Do you have a different answer? 4 bits because there are 12, 12 different orderings. Uh -huh. So we need 4 bits too. OK. Yeah, I think uh, he's right because you need to keep track of the orderings, actually, which one is accessed before the other one. Because in the end, uh, if you use less bits, you may lose the ordering. As a result, you may not get perfectly LRU. In this case, how many, so the key question to ask is, how many different orderings are there? I think you, may, you, uh, you, you meant to say uh, maybe 20, 24 different orderings, right? Basically, you have four ways. And uh, yeah, least recently used, I, I like doing this as, you have these four different possible orders. Uh, most recently used can be four of them. Once you decide on that, uh, the next most recently used can be three of them. Once you decide on that, the next most recently used can be two of them. Once you decide on that, the next recently used might, it can be the last, last one, basically. So it's four factorial. And to be, to, so there, there are four factorial possible orderings, that's 24. And to be able to encode 24, uh, you need five bits, I think, right? OK, yeah. Basically, I think your reasoning was correct, but the number was not correct. Yeah, OK, basically, you need five, five bits in this case. Uh, OK, that's exactly. But of course, now your logic is more complex also. First of all, you need to decode this ordering uh, to be able to decide which one is the worst. You can use a lookup table, I guess. In this case, it's not bad. But it adds complexity, as you can see. Uh, OK, now if I ask you the question, eight-way associative cache, yes? Uh, but four way. Uh, since you have four sets, don't you only need to um, have four numbers, basically? So you can number them one, two, four. If you do that, your cost is higher probably, right? Yes, but you could theoretically do it with less bits. Yeah, it depends on how many sets you have. I agree. In some cases, you may. So if you have four sets, if you do what you said, you have two bits each, it's still not less bits, right? Four times two is eight, but I gave you five. <laughs> exactly. And if you go to eight, now based on induction, you get 8 factorial, and 8 factorial is a large number. So you need log 2 to the 8 factorial number of bits. And I, yeah, we can figure that out. It's not that hard, I think. But it's not nice, actually, because you need, it just actually complicates your logic also. So as a result of this, most modern processors do not implement true LRU, perfect LRU, because this is perfect ordering, right? If you want to keep the perfect ordering, yes, you have to keep the perfect ordering. But if you don't need to, for various reasons, because who said that this is the best management mechanism anyway, right? LRU is not perfect, is not, it doesn't buy you the best performance anyway. Uh, and also, true LRU is complex. There are two reasons for it. Uh, as a result, most systems implement something that tries to be of the same flavor. Not MRU, for example, not most recently used. Evict something that's not most recently used. This way, you just need to keep track of most recently used, and among all of the other things, you randomly pick one. 
Hierarchical are you, you divide basically, you, you form a hierarchy, but you lose information in the hierarchy. As a result, it's not perfect again. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this and some victim, next victim replacement. Only keep track of the victim and the next victim. Most recently used, or, or the, the one to evict next and the one to uh, evict next next. This is kind of not MR, it's not the not MRU, but the other way around, basically. <laughs> but you keep track of two things. Yeah, it's interesting, basically. These things are implemented in dif uh, different systems. I'm not gonna go through them in detail. LRU versus random, which one's better? Anybody guesses? Okay, I'll give, for, I'll give you the priority this time. Yes? It depends on the access pattern. Exactly, it depends on the access pattern. Yeah, do you have a different? Okay, you have the same one. Uh, basically, uh, if you have a four-way cache and you have cyclic references to A, B, C, D, E, LRU gets you a 0% hit rate. At least strict LRU, all right. But if you have random access, this is called set trashing, basically your program working set for that set uh, is larger than the set associativity. You're thrashing that particular set. As a result, random replacement policy is better when thrashing occurs. Basically, you randomly replace and you get much better hit rate. Actually, the better thing to do, perhaps, in this case, is not random, but basically fix four of the things and keep them in the cache. That way you don't need to do, uh, go through any replacement costs and you don't lose any hit rate. Basically, you get 80% hit rate that way in the steady state, right? If you know that you're thrashing, if you know that you have this pattern, you can clearly change your policy for that specific set. But that's of course, requires a lot of intelligence. So in practice, of course, it depends on the workload as we discussed. It turns out the average hit rate of LRU and random are similar. I haven't seen any recent studies on this. I think uh, uh, many uh, applications like graph processing are becoming more random access. So actually random access uh, uh, mechanisms may be better. Although if they're truly random access, then caches are useless also, right? And there's no point in implementing a cache if you're truly random access. So best of, best of both worlds, actually, uh, you can have a hybrid of LRU and random. How do you choose between the two? So you may actually emulate, oh, okay, I'm using LRU policy right now, so I know the hit rate. What if I used a random policy? I would get this sort of hit rate. So you can actually design hardware that can estimate this dynamically. And if the random hit rate starts becoming better, even, even though you're not using it, you're guessing, oh, this is what my hit rate would have been if I used a random policy. Now you can switch to random, right? If you have the hardware to do that. This is a hybrid replacement policy. And you could do that not for all sets, but sample the sets. Or I sample, let's say, I, maybe, maybe I have 64,000 blocks in my cache, 64,000 sets in my cache. For each set, uh, I, have pos I can possibly implement LRU and random, and I can also keep track of it if one of them is active or not active. So what I can do is basically sample, let's say 32 of those sets, and for those 32 representative sets, let's say, oh, LRU is doing better at this time, so I should use LRU for the entire cache sets. That's the idea. Uh, and you should really read this paper. I'm going to assign this at some point that talks about set sampling. And this actually influenced uh, a lot of the recent cache designs, uh, which we will talk about. So let's go back to optimal replacement policy. Bell is optimal, you may have heard of. Uh, it's an optimal replacement policy that's especially developed for disks. And this basically says, replace the block that's going to be referenced furthest into the future by the program. This is optimal with some assumptions. Uh, well, okay, I'll ignore that. Is this optimal for minimizing miss rate? That's the idea, basically. It's optimal for minimizing the miss rate. Uh, assuming some things, of course. Assuming that you actually replace something. So if you don't replace something, if you have the opportunity to bypass the cache, then it becomes a little bit different, actually. Uh, is this optimal for minimizing execution time? So your answer should be no over here, because hit rate is not the same thing as execution time because of what I said earlier. The latency of a cache miss varies from block to block. If you're optimizing for hit rate, you're assuming that latency of cache miss is the same for all blocks. But imagine a case where uh, the, the miss latency of one block is a billion cycles, and the miss latency of all of the other blocks is one cycle. You may want to prioritize that one billion cycle block, right? Because you can, it's not important for the other ones. You can refetch them from some other hierarchy level. So that's exactly why it's not optimal for minimizing the execution time. Uh, and there are many reasons for this, because there are remote versus local caches, there's misoverlapping, uh, and this paper talks about one example of this, misoverlapping. So this is something that we will recommend. So basically the key observation is that some, some misses are more costly than others as their latency is exposed as stall time. 
Reducing the miss rate is not always good for performance. Cache replacement should take into account this memory level parallelism of misses. Okay, very briefly, I'll talk about this. Uh, so physical memory, uh, I mean, you will read this paper, so I'm not going to go through this in detail, at least in this lecture. And I have some slides later on which you can study while you're reading that paper. I like this slide also because this is uh, cache versus page replacement are very interesting. Physical memory is a cache for disk, as we've discussed earlier. It's usually managed by system software via the virtual memory subsystem. And page replacement is actually similar to cache replacement. You have all these pages in main memory. Which one do you replace? Well, how do you, first of all, you need a tax store to keep track of that. Page table is your tax store, basically. A page, uh, it's, a, it's a tax store for a physical memory data store. Physical memory is a data store. Right? And the next level of the hierarchy is disk. That's the demand paging model, right? You, ha you basically have some buffer space on the disk that you can put stuff that you cannot fit into your physical memory. What is the difference between physical memory and the hardware cache? Uh, basically, the required speed of access to the hardware cache is much faster because you're very close to the processor, whereas when you're doing the physical memory management, it's OK to take your time, perhaps, a little bit, unless it's on the critical path, unless you've got a page fault and you need to replace it right away. Right? There, so there's that aspect also. Uh, but usually, people use tricks and supply the uh, particular byte very quickly somewhere. So a number of cache blocks in a cache versus physical memory, that's different. Physical memory is huge, let's say 4 gigabytes. And you manage them at four kilobytes page granularities. That's a lot of cache blocks. Whereas in a cache, you're usually limited. Uh, and also, your cache block size is different, right? Physical memory, you have the page size, which could be four kilobytes, eight kilobytes, one megabyte, one gigabyte large pages. Uh, and also, tolerable amount of time to replacement, find a replacement candidate also may be uh, uh, less, less problematic in page replacement because you have time over there. You're, you're handling this 10 millisecond. Well, hopefully not 10 milliseconds in existing systems, but in, with SSDs, it's much less than 10 milliseconds. Uh, but if you have a disk, really disk, it's 10 milliseconds, let's say. You're handling this really long latency page fault to bring the data from there. You have a lot of time to make a decision as to what do you evict and where do you put the incoming block, right? And of course, role of hardware versus software. Page uh, replacement is usually done uh, through the software today in the operating system, whereas caches need to be managed by hardware. But these things may be changing as memory technology evolves, right? If you have very high density memory that's high speed, this may actually change. That's why it's good to think about this page replacement uh, going forward. OK. Uh, yeah, so there are a lot of design decisions uh, that we need to handle right somehow. Uh, I think we don't have time to cover all of these. But let me, hand let me handle the rights. <laughs> I think handling rights is interesting. So clearly, we need in a tag store to valid bit, tag bits, and replacement policy bits. You may need a dirty bit also, modified bit. Uh, and this depends on what you do with the writes. So the key question is, when do you write the modified data in a cache to the next level? You have a store instruction. It writes the data. Do you write it to the next level? At the time the write happens, that's called a write-through cache. You write to the cache, and you write through it also. And, or do you keep the modified data in this cache and not inform the other cache levels and write it back when the block is evicted to the next level. That's a fundamental design decision. So write back is good because you can combine multiple writes to the same block before eviction. You don't need to go through and write through to the next level. You may actually be doing a lot of writes to the same block. It potentially saves bandwidth between cache levels and also saves energy, clearly. But now, of course, you need to, have, you need to keep track of this dirty modified bit. And it also causes coherence issues between the cache levels. Right? So write through is simpler. Clearly, you don't need this extra bit. All levels are up to date. You get consistency. You, you may actually have simpler cache coherence because uh, no need to check the, processor clo uh, check the close to processor caches tax stores for presence. We'll talk about cache coherence a lot later when we cover uh, multiprocessors. But this is basically how do you implement cache coherence between multiple different processors. If, uh, if, you're, if, 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 if the up to date data is not in the main memory, or the shared caches between two different processors, it becomes more difficult for this processor to get to that data. Right? It needs to somehow go through a coherence protocol. Of course, write through is the big advantage. This advantage is more bandwidth in intensive. Right? You don't combine the writes. If writes, is, if there are multiple writes go to the same cache block, you don't combine them. It's essentially you waste bandwidth. Uh, okay. I think this is where I'll, I'll stop. Uh, and you can study some of these things. 